Well, um, I just want to welcome the people that I do see. I see Helen and Lynn and Stephanie. Do we have anybody else here that I'm not acknowledging? Hi, this is Helen. The host asked me to unmute, so I thought I'd say hello. All right, wonderful. Um, so I prefer, and Stephanie is here. Yes, I am here. And Lynn is here. Yes, I'm here. And Michelle. Bye. Michelle is here. So I really prefer to do a Q&A rather than a lecture. And we had asked people with all the heat going on in our garden and compacted soil in July going on to come with garden questions that you have. And to the best of my ability, I will be um, attempting to answer them in an organically appropriate manner. So if we could have, uh, I'm looking at Helen saying, as we're taking out things like peas, spinach, arugula, et cetera, what can we, we be planting from seed in mid-July? Great question, Helen. Well, it's too soon to replant. It's too soon to replant our um, cool season veggies. I want to wait until the end of July or beginning second week in August to replant things like your peas and spinach and arugula. That being said, it's a wonderful time to direct seed, a second seed or so of any of your summer squashes, including yellow summer squash um, or zucchini or direct seed. Um, another planting of cucumbers that would do well, and also another planting of bush beans. All those things are fine to do. The other thing that I just did in my own garden last week was direct seed, wonderful herb, basil. Basil being very tiny, you don't need to deal with transplants. You can just spread it, small quantity of seeds directly, almost just about an eighth of an inch deep, lightly scratch it into the soil mulch it with straw and water it lightly a couple times a day. All these things that I'm mentioning now with the warm soil should be mulched right after they're planting, watered on a daily basis, lightly at the base, you know, kind of bend down so you're not eroding the soil. And they all should germinate really quickly, like within a week. So does that answer your question, Helen? Yes, thank you, that's super helpful. Great. How about other questions that we've got coming up? And it can be not only what we plant, but any questions you've seen with insects or diseases or things just not growing well. We'd love to hear those kind of things. Uh, this is Lynn. Um, today, this morning, I go early. Uh, I picked off my third Japanese beetle. Right. Uh, they haven't been in the garden. They have been, all three have been sitting on the tops in the flower heads of the Shasta daisies. Mm -hmm. so of course, I picked them off. Um, so, and I went and checked my records. It was, this is a week later than, than my Doug Garden, you know, identified that um, they're here. The Jap mm -hmm. beetles are here. So it's... Yeah almost a week later, um, other than picking them off, any new <laughs> suggestions? Not in the adult form, Lynn. Um, you're absolutely right. Actually, all the beetles are late this year, and it's probably the cool wet spring that we had regarding when they emerge from their larval forms. Um, so the Jap beetles, uh, I was just checking uh, my garden and other gardens that I'm aware um, around in, and they are very, very active on the zinnias. I absolutely love the zinnias, the raspberries, they're decimating the grapes. And I've seen them begin to move into the beans. So early morning type of knocking them off into soapy water is great. I've also started using um, Arbico, and I'm going to ask, uh, let me see, uh, either Nico or Rochelle to put this link in the chat. There is a wonderful um, organic supply company that I love and it's Arbico, A-R-B-I-C-O, uh, Arbico Organics. 
So it's A-R-B-I-C-O, Arbico um, slash, yeah, Arbico Organics, there we go. And Arbico has um, products that are repellent products. Um, so for instance, last year, I got a very, very strong uh, garlic spray as a repellent. You can try making your own homemade garlic spray with garlic and hot peppers and herbs for a repellent. Right. Um, also available, um, and again, this is, um, I wish I had brought this in, but they, they are beneficial oils um, or essential oils. And the essential oils, oils are basically um, cinnamon, and clove and garlic and peppermint. And again, they are available as a repellent. I would try getting them from Arbico Organics or I will send that out to all participants when I get my catalog in here and remember the name of the catalog. Um, something like Earth First or Earthborn or something like that. But um, essential oils. And again, these are things that are not gonna kill the beetles of any types. They are just gonna act as a repellent. And the essential oils also act as almost like a neurotoxin. So uh, after a while, you tend to see less in the way of beetles. And this would work for cucumber beetles and Japanese beetles, those type of question, those type of things. So those are my suggestions about Jap beetles. And then again, to go ahead and use beneficial nematodes in the fall and winter. That catalog that's been listed there, the arbico slash organic, organics.com has specific beneficial nematodes for the larval form of Japanese beetles. So that's your best control. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Who else? I love these questions that are coming up. Well, would those kind of things help with um, caterpillars as well? So you're talking about caterpillars like on cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. I am. Yeah, so my first line of defense, again, with integrated pest management is to realize that it's the white cabbage butterfly. Let's look at the life cycle of this thing. And it's, and it's very, very fast. So the white cabbage butterfly comes in and is attracted to the mustard oil scent of that whole brassica broccoli family. And then unlike aphids, a uh, very good mama, lays eggs on the underneath sides of the leaves. So first line of defense is start turning over all leaves on broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, brush off the single eggs, which are white or green, at which point they're not gonna develop into caterpillars, okay? Next thing is to know life cycle. It takes no more than one week between egg being laid and caterpillar being produced. So brush off the caterpillars, squash them. Third line of defense is to spray the caterpillars with safer's insecticidal soap. So that would be the third line of defense. And moving up, there is organically um, blessed spray called Dipels, the Safer's company, same company that has Safer's insecticidal soap, has a Safer's caterpillar spray. And basically it's a, it's a strain of bacteria that is specific for caterpillar larva. So you can use that too. Thanks. Many lines, you know, I think it's really easy just to turn over leaves and, and see, you know, I get those eggs off first and then brush the caterpillars off. Also identify that caterpillar holes are large. So sometimes we can identify what's, you know, getting your plants by seeing the type of damage that is produced. Okay. So Stephanie, uh, Stephanie had a question. Yes. Stephanie, I and can see your hand. Okay. How can I help you, dear? <laughs> yeah, my question actually follows up nicely on what we just talked about. Um, once like a broccoli plant has been attacked by the caterpillars and has the large holes, will it still, like, is it still gonna survive and can it still produce? Mm -hmm. So um, let me ask, let me go back a little further. How, when did you put your broccoli transplant out? How old is it in the garden? Oh, um, it went outside in April. In April. So it's probably getting pretty large now. Is that right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So caterpillars, as you know, go ahead and make large holes. And with significant leaf um, structures removed or foliage removed, it weakens the plants. So answer to your question is you want to do things that are stimulating new leaf growth. 
my broccoli. Have you noticed any little heads being produced yet by your broccoli? No. Okay. Yes. It's right. right on the crux of the first broccoli is being produced. So we want to do some things that are going to stimulate more leaf growth. And that would be basic organic strategy. Cultivate around your plants once a week before you water. Make sure you have straw mulch to cool the roots. Mm -hmm. Puff dress underneath the mulch with a handful or so of landscape-based compost and scratch it into the soil. And additionally, what I would do would be a foliar spray. That's a leaf spray with liquid kelp to strengthen the, provide micronutrients and provide more um, leaf tissue, more leaf growth. And you just spray the liquid kelp on the foliage? You do. That's one of the times that you can do a foliar spray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And I love kelp, by the way, for all the participants. So kelp we don't use as a regular fertilizer because its effects are cumulative within the leaf tissue. So too much kelp is no good, but when plants have been stressed, hot weather, insect diseases, I do a foliar spray once. And then for instance, if they're hit later on in the season or if they've been hit prior with hail or anything like that, that would be a time. And a third time would be to extend their time in the garden, it gives a little bit of frost protection. So one time in the fall, maybe three times a season, but I swear by kelp, I really do. Where can you get the kelp you use? Oh, you can get it any, you can get that locally during any, um, at any garden center. Okay. And I, you know, would I- Would you mind repeating? I'm sorry, would no. you mind repeating when you use that, when you use the kelp? So when yeah, there's so, some so sort of a weather so event. Kelp, kelp is a wonderful kind of anti-stress nutrient. Uh -huh. It provides micronutrients. It also has some growth stimulants in it. So for instance, when I'm activating my compost pile in the spring, I spray it with liquid kelp. Growth stimulants, it's gonna produce some more foliar growth. So your plant has been hit by the white cabbage butterfly by, uh, the, or the imported cabbage butterfly and it's got caterpillars, it's stressed. It's also stressed with the heat. I would go ahead and spray it after you've removed the eggs and the caterpillars that you can see. So that's a, that's a stress time. Later on in the season, um, maybe in August or so, you might spray one time. And then one time in fall on all plants to extend the harvest a little bit. So three times during the season. And that kelp can be sprayed on any type of uh, plant yes. foliage or are there that specific ones that should be avoided? Even on, so what I would do with plants that have got hairy leaves like tomatoes and cucumbers and squash where we want to keep their leaves as dry as possible, I would, I would water the soil, mix the solution up, diluted solution in a watering can and water the soil. But all plants that are undergoing stress, yep. Kelp is wonderful on that. Am I questions, diseases? Let's let's talk about what's going on, and I, I'm going to depend upon you guys. I've had questions on our gardening platform about stress going on with cucumbers and squash, about plants being really small. I'm wondering what our participants are seeing in their own garden. I, I did have a question around the size of plants because I have trouble with them growing to be big enough to support fruit, it seems like. And maybe I'm putting them out too late or, you know, lot, there's lots of factors there. Okay. So without, without getting, you know, we're, if we're talking about general health of the garden, of course, we need to realize that um, there's nothing we can spray on it or fertilize it that's going to counteract for having great soil. We don't start with great soil. So we start with heavy clay soil. And our heavy clay soil, just a quick review, is low in organic material. So we build the organic content of our soil so that our roots can go down deeply and grow strong foliage very slowly. So to give you a specific idea, we would ideally love an organic matter content of 5%. Most of our front range Colorado soils have got an organic matter content of one to 2%. So the recommendation is to use landscape 
based compost. That's not manure, and I'll explain why. Landscape based compost, an inch and a half, dug into the top three to four or three to five inches. So we don't use compost um, when it's not dug into the soil. That's a separate soil profile. So that's number one. So that's at planting time. Number two is correct watering techniques. So, and that's a big thing. It's a lot more than thinking you're watering the soil because every time you're standing out straight and you're just holding your hose overhead, you're probably doing very superficial, very surface watering. You're also stressing the soil. You're compacting it because it has a stronger spray of water. So what you're gonna aim for in health of plants, and this is a general answer, but it really does impact everything, the health and the growth and the rooting structure, is to get down at root level and to put your hose on a slow stream of water. So not to direct it strong overhead, water at root level, and everything at this time of the year should be mulched. I like straw mulch. And the reason we do straw mulch or mulch of any type is to keep that root zone cool and to also keep water that might be splashing from the lower leaves of plants up to leaves that are higher up on the stem. That's especially important with tomatoes that are starting to show some uh, substantial disease problems right now, not when you put them out. So correct watering, correct mulching, cultivating the soil once a week. This is super important when I'm talking cultivating, I'm talking scratching the soil surface so you're not messing with the roots. If that soil is mulched at the base of the plants, it's super easy to push the mulch back and to just scratch the soil around and then push the mulch back. So those are things that I think at this time of the year are affecting all growth. Things that are planted too early. Um, so I think that we don't take enough attention or don't pay enough attention to things like um, the season or the nighttime temperature of when we're putting our plants out. So warm season plants, even warm season seeds like cucumbers and squash and zucchini, we often don't pay enough attention to the nighttime temperature and the soil temperature. So we may have planted them too early. They may have had you know, a 40 or 50 degree temperature change between nighttime and day instead of being normally up within seven, five to, five to 10 days, those seeds, the squash and cucumbers, some of them are taking two weeks, that stresses them. That takes a lot of energy to do that. Some of them rot in the soil. So at this time of the year, again, we're just gonna work on cultivating. If your plants are not showing any disease, I would just give them time. Make sure you're cultivating, mulching, Maybe put a little bit of more compost and scratch it into the soil. Spray them with liquid kelp and see if that doesn't help. The other thing, as I mentioned when we first started this, was to replant. If your cukes and squash are really not doing well, you can go ahead and replant another seed of that. I did that the other day for a second planting in zucchini, and it was up in four days. Versus my first planting at the end of May that seemed to take forever when we had cold, wet soils. So somebody else had a question. Do we have a question about tomatoes that were not answered or any other thing? Almost everything but my tomatoes seem pretty small, including my garlic, which is making me very sad. Um, so who, let's, let's go back up so we can see that question again. Um, so who had the question about tomatoes seem pretty, everything but the tomatoes seem pretty small? That was me, Helen. I was just um, I okay. Was just so, thinking. Helen, let me ask you. Let's go back a little bit. Um, yeah. um, when did you plant your garlic? The garlic was like October last year. So the garlic should have been. I just harvested my garlic. Yeah, I started That's to true. harvest. I harvested one, and it looked really small. And I was like, oh, maybe you need more time. But the stalks are like two thirds dried out. So I thought it was time, but I wasn't sure. Right. So garlic needs. Again, the size of, uh, were, the, were these um, uh, seed, seed garlic that you, that you planted or was this garlic that you had saved or stuff you got from the store, like the grocery store? Tell me about that. Um, it was something that my friend got from 
the place that you recommend? Do you recommend Arbico Organics for like bulbs and and seed? Well, there's 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 many things. Arbico Organics does have garlic. There's also fillery garlic supply. So it was it was purchased the variety from um, a supply company that specializes in that. But yes, yeah. Okay. So uh, let me tell you something about garlic. Garlic can be tricky. Do you know if it was soft neck or hard neck garlic? Hard neck garlic meaning it's the type that sends up the scapes. I had a little bit of both, but more with scapes. Okay, more with scapes. So you had more hard neck. So the size of garlic is dependent, first of all, upon the variety. Some garlic doesn't produce big bulbs. There's some hard neck or soft neck that is, you know, um, variety specific. It also is super important that you have a really loose soil in full sun that you're planting it in. So um, the year that I did not amend my soil or I, you know, it was, um, it was just pretty hard. And then I did not do winter watering. Garlic needs winter watering. I was unsuccessful with the size of my, uh, my garlic. So to be specific, I usually plant two or three varieties of hard neck garlic and one variety of soft neck garlic. Um, and I rotate the areas. Garlic can build up diseases that I plant them in. I also plant them in around the second week in October, only planting the largest cloves. So as you go towards the inside of the garlic bulb, Pardon me, the cloves tend to get smaller. So those smaller cloves are good for eating, but they're not gonna produce the regular size garlic bulb. So three to four inches apart or four inches apart, four to five inches deep on the larger cloves. And then you mulch immediately over them. Again, I use straw. You can even use weeds that haven't gone to seed or leaves if it's late enough in the fall. If you're using leaves so that they don't mat down, what I tend to do is take a lawnmower and run over the leaves so you break it up. Or if your leaves are dry, you kind of step on them and you water them. I think a lot of people don't attend enough to winter watering on garlic. And unless we have adequate snow, snowfall during the whole winter, then you don't get that adequate root growth over the winter that they need in order for do, to produce enough of the leaves. So garlic is also um, a fairly member of the allium family. It's fairly shallow rooted and you need to be careful that you're not messing with the roots much. So I tend to leave that mulch on all the time. Uh, early spring, that foliage is the first thing that emerges. I usually harvest some of the first greens for, you know, stir fries or whatever, and it produces just fine. And when I noticed one third of the leaves starting to yellow from the bottom up, that's the time that I dig my garlic. I did notice that I got a better harvest this year. They were adequately spaced, so a good four to five inches apart. I did winter watering several times. Um, but I noticed that not all of them were the same size bulbs. So um, it could be, you know, some of them got messed with with squirrels when they were burying some of their stuff and destroying my garden. Um, I don't know, or some of the feral cats, um, but I had some of my best garlic. I also did fertilize them. Um, I like espoma, E-S-P-O-M-A. It's a kind of a low analysis, a, a complete organic fertilizer. I fertilized them one time when I planted them. And that was it. The watering is crucial, making sure you're not missing with the roots. Hopefully that um, is some information about garlic. We will be holding, um, for more specific information about varieties and whatever, in September, we will be holding an expanding or extending the harvest class where we will get more information about putting your garden to bed. We're also having a fall plant sale on August 7th that you guys should know about where we will be doing a pre-ordering of garlic. So that's my, you know, splurb about, or blurb about um, what's coming up and, and garlic. What other kind of questions, or am I the only person who's showing diseases on tomatoes? I'm gonna say, oh my goodness, talk to me about your tomatoes. 
it seems like that I always have leaves on my tomatoes that are, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm over or under watering, you know, when they turn kind of yellow and crunchy. Okay. For lack so, of a better word. Yellow and, and crunchy. Okay. Um, the yellow and crunchy is not um, a watering problem. Yellow and crunchy is a disease problem. So let me give you some basic information about tomatoes. Tomatoes are the family that crop rotation is crucial to practice. And when I'm talking crop rotation, I'm talking about that whole family. It's called the Solanaceae family. That's tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. If you're growing a lot of that same family in the same place, you're more prone to disease. One of the biggest challenges for diseases on tomatoes um, are growing potatoes in the same area, and then you forget you have a rogue, what I call a rogue potato, you forget to harvest them all. And the disease that's on the tuber of the potato then gets transferred the to the tomato. So what I'm seeing on some of my tomatoes right now are the first stages of many fungal problems that they get. And unfortunately, these problems develop on the older leaves first, which are at ground level. So first line of defense is any leaf stems, uh, leaf petioles, when I'm talking leaf petioles, those are the leaf stems that attach the leaves to the stem. So that, that's spelled, let me spell that for Rochelle, P-E-T-I-O-L-E-S. First line of defense, the leaf petioles with the leaves. With any leaf at the bottom of the plant, cut them off. Don't put them in your compost pile. What mine are showing are the start of two fungal diseases. I'm not gonna have her even write this down because you would need to get this analyzed in a lab. I'm just gonna tell you. One of them is called septoria leaf spot and it shows with little gray circles inside spots on the leaves. The other one is another fungal disease that's related to the disease that produced the great um, uh, potato famine in Ireland, okay? And it's basically early blight. It's Altenaria solanii. Like I said, you don't need to know that. But fungal diseases are starting and the early blight looks like concentric rings that are radiating out with holes that fall out. Another thing that's starting is yellowing on one side of the plant. That's a wilt, um, and that's either ver verticillium or fusarium wilt. Any leaves that don't look normal, you need to get off. You need to have straw at the bottom of all your tomato plants so that when you're watering at ground level, and I'm not gonna scream at you, but no overhead watering on tomato plants, please, 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 that spreads these disease problems that exacerbate in hot weather. You never see it at the first time of the year. So let's go ahead and remove any plant, any leaves that are showing yellowing, remove them with the stem, remove any leaves that are showing blotches or spots. Those are disease not in the compost pile. Straw at the bottom, water at the bottom. Tomatoes are what we call heavy feeders. They take a lot of nutrients out. So go ahead and scratch a handful of uh, this is SPOMA that I mentioned, E-S-P-O-M-A, the organic vegetable fertilizer. Scratch a handful of that in the soil. And the other thing that I like to do for strengthening my plants, I would go ahead at this time and do a, we had talked about using kelp, but you know, a tablespoon per gallon of water and water the soil around the plants with that. That's going to strengthen it. And the other thing that I've started to do this year with both my tomatoes and peppers, and I do this every two weeks. So for tomato plants, two tablespoons of Epsom salts. Who thought Epsom salts would be that great? For pepper plants, one tablespoon of Epsom, plant, Epsom salts. Just spread in a ring around the base of the plant, but you need to scratch it in. So what Epsom salts do is they supply magnesium, and that produces, um, potentiates cell growth, leaf growth. So Epsom salts, kelp, you're gonna prune off all those things that don't look normal. Now, 
The other thing that I'm seeing or that I need to tell you is that tomatoes need even watering. So what that means is you need to take your finger, remember that water absorbs very slowly in our clay soil. So you water slowly um, and then you, maybe you wait 10 minutes, you look under the mulch and you put your finger down and you put finger down in the soil or a stick if you don't wanna use your finger um, and that your finger should come up with moist soil. If it doesn't, if it's just at the surface, then you're not doing a strategy that's promoting deep rooting. You wanna get, because tomato roots, a healthy tomato plant, their roots can go down a foot. Deeper rooted plants can subsist or fend off disease challenges and insect challenges a lot better. So make sure that you're watering correctly because if you're not, if you're flooding your plant and then you're on vacation or something, you forget to water it a week and it's drought, then especially with tomatoes that are grown in containers, they can come down with challenges, which we're starting to see the first ones of called blossom end rot. Blossom end rot, when I describe it, um, I'm sure everybody has had it who's grown tomatoes. It looks like a sunken black area on the blossom end, not the stem end, but the blossom end of the tomato. And then it, it turns black and mushy. And that is a, um, what I call an OE. Um, <laughs> she's gonna put it down, OE meaning operator error. <laughs> this is an operator error challenge, which means you are providing inconsistent moisture. And what happens when you provide inconsistent moisture to tomatoes is they are, they are unable to take up the bounteous quantities of calcium that we have in the soil. With the plant unable to take up enough calcium that's responsible for cell wall strength, then it develops a calcium deficiency, deficiency and you get those mushy black areas. So you can deal with that by um, consistent watering, always consistently moist at the base of the plant and, and straw mulch and see if that doesn't help you with blossom and rot, which is going to emerge. Other things that I have seen on tomatoes are curling leaves at the side. So the leaves curl up, that's a temperature and sunlight mm -hmm. challenge. So although tomatoes require six to eight hours of sunlight per day. Our ultraviolet radiation folks is super strong here. So I started um, over my tomato cages when I remember it, I don't do it routinely, uh, placing some shade cloth, which you can get at garden centers. And I just clip it on with some clothespins so it doesn't blow off. So a little bit of shade will also prevent a challenge that tomatoes and peppers get if there is not um, good foliar cover over the fruit, and that's called sun scald. So sun scald can develop. So Stephanie looks like she's got her hand up. Before I just keep going on, Stephanie, what is your question? Yes, um, so with that leaf curl, I've noticed mine are curling upward, mm -hmm. um, but they do look healthy, like there's no yellowing or spots yeah. or anything. That's yeah. just the temperature. I think it's the temperature and the sun. So okay. a little bit of that shade cloth is, you know, is fine. Okay. Um, so try that and the even watering. Yeah, that's that's super strong ultraviolet light. Okay, yeah. and then um, that I just wanted to clarify that part. Um, my question was, so I have a cherry tomato in a container uh -huh. and um, had some jack be little and maybe sugar pumpkin seeds got mixed in and those have now sprouted in the container with the um tomato <laughs> so that was not expected um i've been fertilizing to make sure you know there's enough nutrients for all of them is that something that's okay to let continue play out with those two living in the same large container together. How large is your container diameter wise? And um, do you think? I would say it's maybe like 18 inches by two feet. Okay. So my, my question would be no, it's not okay. It, okay. May look, it may look like it's okay now, but uh -huh. um, you need to, 
decide if your cherry tomato is more valuable than the, than the sprouting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know Jack Beetle is a lovely variety, but although the pumpkins are small, uh, that's another heavy feeder that's gonna take everything out and uh, deplete everything of nutrients in space. So at this point, I would um, be kind of a, a rough parent, if you will, and remove <laughs> the, the later sprouting ones and, and thank them for their presence. Um, can you, can you trans? Uh, can you transplant them? Just so somewhere? here's the deal with the whole pumpkin squash family. They have tap roots. Um, you, you can try. And if, you, if you're able to get a whole bunch of that up, um, you then want to water it in your new container or place with some kelp and shade it for a couple of days and make sure you mulch it. Sure, give it a try. Make sure with any transplanting that you're doing, it's in the cool of the day. Okay, so, but don't let let them all <laughs> coexist. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank those, you. Those are lovely. I've had that happen too with uh, varieties that you know, especially with cherry with tomatoes. Tomatoes will sprout every place that you have a tomato that has fallen down, and that's when you get some disease conditions. So maybe that's a time to address that. If you have volunteer tomatoes around, um, I would recommend that you you not let them continue in your garden. It's a good spreader of disease just like potatoes. Okay, any other hands that I have missed or, or questions that, that we're seeing? We probably have about another five minutes. This has just been a great session. I love these questions. Um, I wanna make sure that we're not, um... yeah. I have a question around spacing. I, I was working with, talking with the master gardener recently and she encouraged me to condense my planting rather than spacing it out. And, you know, I grew up with the plant in rows and follow the, the three inches, six inches or whatever it is between mm -hmm. plants and everything. And then, you know, also thinking about you get that white spot on squash leaves and all from things being too close. What are your thoughts on spacing? So I, th I think it's essential to give things. So I like to space things so that at maturity, the leaves almost are producing a living mulch. So, you know, squash plants, if you're talking summer squash plants, they're, they're four feet apart. Um, but in order to address your question about, you know, condensing versus spacing, you need to give things air circulation in between them. So let me tell you my spacing that I do between my tomato plants and broccoli and stuff like that. Squash, I've already told you, three and a half to four feet between those leaves. Um, my tomatoes are spaced two and a half feet apart, okay? My broccoli and cabbages are 18 inches apart. That being said, um, if you're dealing with things like tomatoes, you can go ahead um, and plant carrots at the base. Uh, the carrots will open up some area for tomato roots. So you can very often double the space in your garden by not only looking at how much space do they need, but can I plant a veggie near there or an herb that's a little bit more shade tolerant or that roots at a different level so that I'm not robbing nutrients. Um, and I cannot address the question of spacing without also addressing the whole concern that I have um, with food waste. So, I think that we grow too many of the same plant. When you realize that one tomato plant can give you 40 pounds of tomatoes, do we really need to try all 10 or 12 varieties that we thought we needed to try this year versus giving that area over to a plant in another family? Um, so I think that we grow too much of the same family and that we also do not pay enough attention to biodiversity in our plots. So biodiversity meaning, are we planting enough flowers that are going to attract beneficial insects or herbs that have strong smells that can repel different insects? So I think we always need to think of those things not as a uh, something that's going to take away space from growing my veggies, but something that's going to add to the health of what I'm growing. And hopefully, okay, uh, I'm looking at Helen's other question real quickly before we have to end. Is there a way to know if you have a determinant tomato if it wasn't specifically labeled? So determinant 
tomatoes uh, were originally bred for the Campbell Soup Company canning industry. And they produce a flush of flowers all at once. So once that flowers are produced on the ends of the branches, and the reason they were bred for that industry was it's very easy for them, the harvest machines to come over and harvest them all at once. So once those flush of blossoms are produced and harvest occurs, they don't produce anymore. The plants are usually shorter. Most determinate plants um, you can cage or not, but they're not going to be those seven to eight foot tomato plants that are indeterminate plants. That being said, there are also other varieties that have been bred that are called bush varieties of some of the larger ones. Any of these shorter ones or the bush indeterminate ones are going to show thicker branches. They're going to be shorter and they're going to have a shorter distance in between the plant nodes, N-O-D-E-S, which is where the branches are produced from. So that's, that's my spiel about that. Um, and it looks like we are almost at an end. I just want to thank everybody. Are there any outstanding questions that you feel you can't wait for? My email is judy at doug.org, J-U-D-Y at D-U-G.org. If there are just some crazy things that have come up, Otherwise, we, um, I don't want to leave anybody hanging. I really want to thank you for um, not only attending, but your great questions that you've asked, you know, spacing and some disease and, and insect type stuff and general type care. Oh, Stephanie has her hand up. <laughs> Sorry, can't... one last question about yeah, um, with tomatoes. Um, Got it. Can tomatoes and potatoes be grown next to each other in containers. Yeah, um, absolutely so. Um, but again, this is a reason for making a garden plan and remembering what you're growing. Then the next year, you're not going to grow a tomato and a potato in those same containers. In those containers, specifically. In those containers, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and make sure when you're harvesting your potatoes that you're harvesting Fully. I will tell you, um, because I did this with my grandkids, um, a, a very short tomato variety in, in a large container. And then I don't know if any of you are of my generation or can remember when Denver Recycles used to do the purple recycling bins out. This kind of takes me back, but they are these uh, kind of large uh, box-like containers. So we drilled holes in the bottom of them. Um, and we planted uh, some potatoes in it. And for any of you who have got kids or grandkids growing potatoes in containers is fabulous because at the harvest, it was kind of a one-upsmanship where um, Alina, I have Alina who's nine and Eamon who's six, it really was, we had two containers of these going. And Eamon who was a six-year-old was sure that some of the larger ones that Alina had harvested were ones that he had, she had stolen from his container. So potatoes are one of the best ways of getting kids into growing, getting excited, because they're so easy. They took care of them. Um, they, they worked with them. Um, and very honestly, what we used as starts for organic potatoes, we got from Whole Foods, some of the, um, the tiny little potatoes from, from Whole Foods. So you can get away with that, the organic stuff. So that's my spiel on that. We do need to leave because I have another training. So hopefully this has been helpful. We're going to be back in another two weeks. Same people tell people about this. Come prepared with questions. I love answering this. And also be aware that we have our uh, community platform, community.dug.org, um, that you're welcome to join and post any questions in that. And I monitor that on a daily basis. So if anything else comes up in the interim, Put it on the platform. We have different topics under insect diseases, soil, whatever. Thank you all for coming. This was we wonderful. Love, uh, Thank love you. having you seen you here. Tell everybody about us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thank you.